Welcome back. By now, you already know that Sweet Stories in the Dell is a podcast about the people, programs, and stories unique to Sweetbriar College. And just a reminder, my name is Caperton Morton. I'm a Sweetbriar alum and an independent audio producer working in collaboration with the college to share these stories with you. Also, it's important to remember that Sweetbriar is a women's college in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. And out here in the country, academia isn't constrained by the four walls of campus classrooms. Faculty and students take full advantage of Sweetbriar's rolling hills, fields, and forests, especially when nature benefits the coursework. That image transitions well to Episode 3, Centers Without Walls. It's a three-part series about Sweetbriar's three academic centers, the Center for Creativity, Design, and the Arts, the Center for Human and Environmental Sustainability, and the Center for Engineering, Science, and Technology in Society. The centers have been designed to create connections, or firm existing connections, with other institutions and organizations. The center directors often coordinate with these entities to bring people who might be visiting from somewhere else in the world to the Sweet Bar campus. Visitors share their expertise and experiences from their lives and fields of work, enhancing the students' educational experiences. Lectures, concerts, and exhibits arranged by the centers are also offered to the greater Sweet Bar community. Throughout the episode series, we'll also hear about the innovative ways the center projects put Sweetbriar's expansive acreage to use. We begin with the Center for Creativity, Design, and the Arts. I'm Carrie Brown. I'm the director of the Center for Creativity, Design, and the Arts at Sweetbriar, and I'm a professor of English and Creative Writing. Would you please speak to your career path and and how it sort of spiraled you around to your position at Sweetbriar? It it has spiraled around, although in some ways I think the trajectory is is not an uncommon one. When I graduated from college, I went to work as a journalist, and I'd I'd worked as a student journalist throughout my, my years. I went to Brown University, and I had internships at a couple of newspapers over the summers. And I worked very happily as a journalist for 12 years. And then when my husband, John Gregory Brown, who runs the English and Creative Writing Program here, published his first novel, he returned to the world of academia and was was offered a position at Sweetbriar and, and persuaded me that this would be a good place for us to move. And so we did. We arrived here with three children. Our youngest was three months old. And it was indeed a wonderful place, especially to raise small children. But I had given up my job, and I had given up the fellowship of my working community, and I very quickly realized that I I needed to be at work. And I started writing fiction, which I had not written before. And then uh, in a year or so, I went to the University of Virginia and began sitting in on classes in the MFA program um, run by George Garrett, who was an immensely generous teacher. After a little over a year, Carrie decided to enroll in the two-year MFA program, And in her second year of the program, she published her first novel. And then since then, I've just continued to write steadily and to combine that with with teaching as well. This is Sweetbriar President Meredith Wu. Well, when I came in uh, in 2017, in the fall, the faculty worked hard over the summer to come up with a new vision for Sweetbriar. And one of the things they presented was a notion of three centers. And uh, there wasn't much behind it other than the notion and desire to have three areas which can coordinate activities, uh, academic and otherwise, for the college. In our case, centers are designed so that they develop, inculcate, and um, and make sure that we have a distinction in particular arena. So that means that we want to make sure that we have distinction in the arts, through collaboration, if possible, with VCCA. In 1978, Mount San Angelo, an estate owned by Sweet Bar College, was rented to the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts for $1 per year. 
This 410-acre estate had once belonged to the sister of Sweet Bar's founder, Indiana Fletcher Williams. In the 1870s, the young daughter of Indiana and her husband, James Henry Williams, would ride her pony Bounce over to Mount San Angelo to visit her Aunt Lily. But of course, that was long before Route 29 divided the two Amherst County properties. The Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, or the VCCA, is an artist community, offering residencies to visual artists, writers, and composers. Fellows, as they're called, come from all over the world. And acceptance standards are high. In fact, some of the fellows in residence have been MacArthur Genius Award winners and Pulitzer Prize winners as well. The VCCA's bucolic country setting is similar to Sweetbriar's. Both are distraction-free havens. Residencies range from two weeks to two months, and fellows often return again and again for additional residencies. And now there's a major update to report. Sweetbriar has accepted the VCCA's 2019 proposal to purchase the Mount San Angelo estate. This sale leaves the college with an over 2,800-acre campus, along with additional funds in the Sweetbriar Endowment. Since the VCCA is temporarily closed because of COVID-19, they're using this time to make improvements to the site, and their 2021 reopening will be just in time for the 50th anniversary of their 1971 opening at the VCCA's original Charlottesville location. Well, there is a natural synergy between this place and uh, VCCA. From our perspective, because we are located in a remote place and because of our scale, it becomes difficult to bring people in from outside. We can have first-rate, world-class composers, writers, and painters come and share their thoughts and ideas and creativity with our students. They use all our facilities across the street, so they use swimming pool and all other facilities, not to mention 19 miles of trails and all the wonderful things. But also, it enables the fellows there to have, if they so wish, uh, some teaching experience through Sweetbriar. So it's a great career path to actually teach, if they could, as fellows, as uh, Carrie Brown has made possible. I read that flexibility seems to have played a big role for you while you were raising your young children, writing and teaching. How do you put that flexibility to use as the director? Well, I, I, flexibility is one word for it. I think, you know, necessity is, is the mother of invention. Um, when President Wu helped the, the faculty to identify some of the college's existing strengths and assets and the, and the ways in which we might build particular forces around those, one of them, of course, was the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Our relationship with VCCA um, has always been a wonderful one. We've had fellows in the classroom in, in all kinds of ways um, to teach master classes, to give lectures, performances, readings. We have not found um, a way to institutionalize that relationship, to fundraise for it, to support it. So I think what was called for was was flexibility to just try things, which is another thing that President Wu says all the time that I really appreciate. And she's not afraid of failure, and it's it's something that she wants to kind of inculcate into the students as well, that, that trying something, going down a particular path, you can't know everything in advance. You have to plan, and you have to understand your circumstances. But that that sort of spirit of let's try something that seems to us to be a good direction is just a wonderful attitude. It, it helps you get over that fearfulness of, of making a mistake. So flexible, but, but also just simply willing to try to put some things on the ground. And that's really what I think I was charged with doing in, in the center's inaugural years. I understand that you've stepped away from your writing to make time for the center. That is a big sacrifice, Uh, so thank you. No, well, thank you for saying so. How hard has this been for you? I do miss uh, the writing 
a lot. And, and, I, and I know that President Wu will make it possible for me to return to that and that there's a value to the college in, 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 in my publishing uh, career. And I'm, I'm humbled that President Wu asked me to do it and, and I've, I've done my best to get things going. When President Wu asked me to direct the center, I, I reminded her that I did not have a background in arts administration, that that was not part of my, my skill set. And um, she assured me that she thought I, I had what was needed to get, get things going. Um, and so it's been re- a really engaging process for me. I asked Carrie what has aided in her success as the center's director. I'm lucky that because John and I have been at Sweetbriar for so long, 26 years it will be this summer, I have a long relationship with VCC. I actually spent a year working at VCC while I was teaching at Sweetbriar, helping with um, their international programs, in part because I wanted to understand what the artist residency experience was like from the inside. I wanted to understand it institutionally. But so that long relationship was really a benefit for me. I had deep personal relationships, not just with the people who run VCCA, but also with many, many fellows who have come back over the years. If I was a stranger to either of these institutions, I think much of what we've been able to accomplish in the last couple of years would have taken a lot longer. And that history has certainly been helpful. So it's allowed me to do some things more rapidly, perhaps, than someone who was new to the institution. What specific ways does the center enhance the lives of Sweetbriar students and the community at large? One of the ways in which I've been thinking about the center is as a way of connecting Sweetbriar and and its students and its faculty and staff to the larger world. Because we're not in the middle of a big city, because we are our own island in a way, building those bridges to other institutions, to other individuals, to other movements requires more effort than it might if we were in the middle of a you know bustling metropolis with museums and, and concert halls and um, galleries. So I've really been thinking of the center as, um, as an engine for creating partnerships with individuals and with other institutions. And by bringing artists to campus, by creating opportunities for them to teach here, um, principally in the three-week terms through the courses that we're calling the Fellows Studio Courses, by bringing greater numbers of artists to campus in general to present their work, these events are all open to the public. So I think that's a tremendous benefit to the students. They're, they're literally meeting more artists and seeing more of their work and their, their process. So both the finished product and the process. I was actually looking back over some of the documents that, that I put together about the people we've brought. And we've, we've brought, let me see if I can count up the number of, um, yeah, so in, in one year, 13 BCCA fellows from a wide range of artistic disciplines, filmmakers, composers, writers, visual artists, offered presentations at the salon events just in 2018, 2019. That's, that's a lot. And then the first three fellow studio courses will have introduced six artists from outside the standing faculty to teach at the college. Right there, that's the creation of an incredibly diverse constituency in terms of people who are practicing in the arts and are available to share their work with the students. And, and the range of them is, is really extraordinary. I was, I was reminded looking back at the first Salon series that one of the first fellows who came to perform is, a, is an Irish contemporary classical composer. And she came, and she's also deaf which is, yes, just blow your mind. She came and she performed a portion of the the work that she created for the Bronte Parsonage in England. Eilish Nirian is an Irish contemporary classical composer. In 2015, she composed Linger, the six-piece composition as a three-month-long music installation for the Bronte Parsonage. While recording, Ailish played the Bronte family's restored piano and actually embraced the ambient sounds of the Parsonage. They became part of the composition, like the faint sound of the clock ticking or a bird singing in the garden.
There was another composer, very famous composer, Andrea Clearfield, who came and talked about her work. She recorded the last court singer of a remote village in Nepal. It was, it was part of the World Oral Literature Project of Cambridge University. <laughs> So she showed this wonderful film about her and her team sort of trekking across the mountains to reach this village and then played some of the recordings that she made in this village and showed some of the video footage of her recording these these in, it, it, just amazing, unique singers. And then she sat down at the grand piano and played some of her own compositions that later went on to a, a very significant premiere. <laughs> I mean, just those two women alone are a kind of blow-your-mind experience, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. As you may remember in Episode 2, At the Core, President Wu explains why the arts are important and included in the Leadership Core. She believes the arts is a gateway for students where they develop empathy. And by experiencing someone else's perspectives, the arts become a pathway to becoming a more engaged citizen. I think that we all know uh, intuitively and through our experience that um, that participation in the arts, whether as a creative artist or as an audience member, uh, does in fact increase one's uh, cultural literacy and, and, and therefore one's empathy for people who might be different from oneself. Um, I do think that experience of encountering um, somebody else's imagination uh, is, is eye-opening. And, and it broadens your own experience in the world to encompass somebody else's experience. The the first fellow studio course that was that was taught here. Um, these courses are all interdisciplinary, project driven, intensive. They take place during the three week terms when students are taking only one course. And the first one was taught by a, a visual artist, a composer, and a writer. Uh, they developed the proposal for the course. And it was called A Multiplicity of Narratives. And over the course of the three weeks, students developed uh, a fictional artist. They created a, a character, a history for that person, uh, an ethos, a creative direction. Then they were tasked with imagining a, a large-scale temporary art installation that would have been created by this imagined fictional artist and then to work collaboratively with their peers to create a soundscape that would accompany an audience's experience of these works of art. And along the way, of course, they were exposed to a huge number of writers, to visual artists working on large scale. So Christo and you know, many of the other the spiral jetty, you know, we can all think of these kind of iconic works. Most of the students had never even heard of these and certainly never seen them and never learned about them, never learned about their the genesis of those works or the career trajectories of those artists. I know, because of everything that the students said, that that was a completely thrilling and eye-opening experience for them. It brings more of the world to you, but then you start learning more about yourself, too. I think when you are, are reading and uh, 
it, it stirs up memories and you begin to feel a, a connection with these people across the world and across time. I, I, we, we indeed hope that that is exactly what happens, is that in the process of learning about art that was created perhaps long before the students were born, um, and art that's being created now, that they begin to see the ways in which their own experience is, is resonant in that. All the fellow studio courses include the practice of art and then the making of art. So students are being asked to do two things. They're being asked to look historically at a particular art form, and then they're being asked to think themselves creatively and to, and to do that same thing themselves. Okay, you, you mentioned the Sweetbriar College and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts Fellowship. And this is actually the first formal collaboration between the two institutions. Um, it's certainly the first formal collaboration between the two institutions that we, we hope will become ongoing and will continue to evolve and change. The, the first year of doing this, or it's really the first year and a half, um, th these had been experiments, trying to figure out what's the right process for bringing artists from outside the community to teach here, what will be resonant for artists out in the world, um, and what will be important and successful for the students. One of the things we learned very quickly when we sort of put out a call for proposals for VCC teaching fellowships <clears throat> is we, we got over 40 proposals from around the world, and each proposal was submitted by a team of three artists. Those were part of the boundary conditions. We wanted interdisciplinary projects. So you can do the math there. That was 120 artists representing an incredible range of disciplines who put together proposals to come and teach here. And that was enormously affirming. That really said to us, well, we are creating an opportunity for artists that they want that they want to come be in residence at VCCA to interact with students, to share their work with young people. And, and that, was a, that was a wonderful discovery. You, so you've arranged for um, Elizabeth Colbert mm -hmm. is that, to come this, this fall. Wow, it's 2020. To discuss her book, The Sixth Extinction. Tell me what she'll be doing. So Elizabeth... Uh, and, and the sixth extinction is the third year of the Common Read program at the college, which is, is one of the initiatives that I wanted the center to undertake. I just think it's a really good way for the college community to come together around a particular topic. So the first year we brought the, the writer Chimamanda Adichie, um, whose novel Americana has been taken up by practically every school in the country, I think. She's, she may be the most well-recognized writer and public intellectual internationally in the world right now. She came to Sweetbriar in 2006 when her first novel was published and, and John and I have maintained a friendship with her so it was it was remarkable to be able to, to bring her back here. She's in great demand. And this year, of course, we have um, the scholar Emily Wilson who's the first woman to translate the Odyssey into English and at the same time, the novelist and classicist uh, Madeline Miller whose novel Circe based on um, an incident in the, in the Odyssey, um, takes, takes that incident and, uh, and turns it into something really quite extraordinary. So the two of them, their books, Circe and the Odyssey, have been, have been the common read for this year. I want every year to shift the conversation somewhere. So moving from a novel like Americana, which sort of tackles the immigrant experience, it's about a young Nigerian woman who comes to the United States, um, and also tackles issues of race, to then tackling issues of antiquity and one of the most iconic uh, works in the canon. I wanted to move to something that was very contemporary, but address the environment. And Elizabeth Colbert's um, book, The Sixth Extinction, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015, seemed a really good place to start, she, in part because she writes so much about the environment through The New Yorker and through other venues. She's, she's very, very, very current. Since our January interview, Carrie rescheduled Emily Wilson and Madeline Miller for a visual visit in November. 
She's hoping that Elizabeth Colbert might be able to visit campus in person in April of 2021. But, of course, that could change. So she is coming both to talk about the the process of putting together the Sixth Extinction and the research that went into that book, but also to talk with some other experts in the field about climate change, about biodiversity. So we're putting together now a panel of people who will be in conversation with her. And in fact, I'm, I'm having lunch tomorrow with Linda Fink and Lisa Powell, who's the new director of the Center for Sustainability, to talk about some other initiatives that we want to do around around that issue. All these ventures, of course, as you can imagine, they cost money. Right now, we're really focused on how can we find people, institutions, foundations in the world who love what Sweetbriar is doing, both broadly as an institution and specifically through the Center for Creativity, Design, and the Arts, and how can we get them to be our partners in making these experiences available. there anything else that you'd like to add about anything yeah I'm very grateful I mean I'm very grateful to the college um, in many ways it it, the institution has given John and and myself and our children a a beautiful life here and 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 a highly productive one I think between us John and I have 12 books all but one of which were written here so I'm really I'm grateful to the college for the ways in which it, it has been a, um, it's been a kind of inspiring landscape for us. I, I'm, I'm especially grateful for this the experience I've had over the past couple of years thinking about creativity, thinking about its role in, in my own life and in, and in the lives of, of students and, and people in general. You know why do we need this in our world? And I've come to think more and more, about creative expression as really necessary to, to sort of human health, emotional health, that it is, it's an experience of, of joy, even when the subject material is is difficult. And, and to be able to bring that experience of joy, and some of it is just plain unbridled joy, but to bring that experience of joy into the daily lives of students that just feels like a privilege to me. You know, as I said, I think President Wu was trying to find ways to connect the college to the larger universe out there. And so I've come to think of the center as a way of sort of throwing open doors and windows and making it possible for the students to see what's beyond our most immediate horizons and also to bring people here to campus and and give them the pleasure of, of being in this beautiful place. Thank you. President Wu most certainly chose wisely when asking Carrie Brown to direct the Center for Creativity, Design, and the Arts. Carrie has done a marvelous job of fortifying President Wu's blossoming vision ahead for the college. I'd like to thank composer Elish Nirian for allowing me to share Mr. Bronte's study from her composition, Linger. And another thank you to composer Andrea Clearfield. She shared her recording of Tashid Sering, who is the last of the royal court singers, singing the offering song. She also sent Shar Kiri, which is the second movement of the Tse Gola Cantata. And she sent the piece playing now, Long Ta Avalo Ki Teshvara, or Wind Horse Compassion. Thanks again to my pod squad, L. Warner, Jane Dewar, Mitzi Morgan, Deanne Blanton, Madge Vostein, and staff member Clayley Steckel. I'm grateful for all the ways they support me. Come back in a couple of weeks for part two of episode three, Centers Without Walls. 
We'll take a look at the Center for Human and Environmental Sustainability with its director, Lisa Powell. She's also an associate professor of environmental studies and was brand new to campus when we spoke last January. Until then, take care.